Hello everyone and welcome to Sandbox EDB. Today's mission will be a test of the Libertina 2 shuttle, a new version of the original Libertina which met its tragic demise in ETS 10A. The Libertina 2 was built natively in stock without any interference from Kerbal Joint Reinforcement and that will hopefully solve the problem we saw with its predecessor. ETS 11A will carry 52 tons of fuel to Hoffman Station with a total payload mass of 58.5 tons. It is rated for as much as 75 tons. Proceeding now with the countdown, we are T minus 20, T minus 15, T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, engine ignition, 1, and liftoff. We have liftoff of ETS 11A. Head for Hoffman Station with 52 tons of fuel, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. The full shuttle stack has 22 engines lit on launch. Eight of those are on the boosters, nine on the external tank, and five on the shuttle itself. Here we begin the roll program. Commander for this mission is Seanberry Kerman, who was also commander of ETS-9. Engineer is Albert Kerman, who also flew on ETS-6, ETS-8, and the ED Prime test. Roll program looks smooth. The Libertina 2 features a somewhat modified and more stable and maneuverable forward swept wing design. That's among its improvements over the previous shuttle design. Another improvement is the use of eight thud engines uh, alongside a single skipper instead of the mainsail engine that was on the previous Libertina. That is a cheaper design and also leads to greater control. It does, however, reduce the payload mass of the shuttle system somewhat, as does the fact that the external tank engine cluster is now recoverable and has a heat shield and detaches from the rest of the external tank. The boosters are, of course, also recoverable. They have one drogue chute at the top and 15 main chutes on their side so that they will splash down in the ocean horizontally. Here we are getting ready for booster separation. We recall that that was the problem of the Libertina before. Let's see if it will go smoothly for the Libertina 2. Booster separation. And it looks like the separation is clean. The boosters are clear of the wings of the shuttle. However, there was a misfire. Uh, two of the separation motors on the external tank were for some reason grouped with the separation motors on the boosters and they are firing currently when they are not supposed to. So the external tank will have to be separated from the shuttle without the use of the separation motors. Here the shuttle is continuing on to orbit. Again the top tank of the external tank is locked at this point. You can see the gimbling of the KS-25 engine as the shuttle continues and will begin to adjust its inclination to match that of Hoffman Station. You see eight thuds, a single skipper on the external tank attached to the section that will return. We will attempt a recovery of that. The shuttle itself of course has the single KS-25 as well as four rapiers. Here we have the unlocking of the top tank on the external tank. Plenty of fuel for the system to make orbit. The external tank will not make orbit of course, it will stop just shy of orbit so that it re-enters. We have thrall down as the shuttle gradually builds up its apoapsis. A reminder for those who uh, didn't catch the previous broadcast, Libertina is the Discworld goddess of the sea, apple pie, certain types of ice cream, and short lengths of string from the Terry Pratchett Discworld novels. Preparing for main engine cutout here, as we see the apoapsis come into contact with the orbit of Hoffman Station, we have main engine cutout. 
and now the shuttle will unlock its main tank for orbital operations and the external tank separation will take place there we have external tank separation normally of course the separation motors would pull it well away of the shuttle but in this case the shuttle will have to maneuver itself away from the external tank using its burner thrusters by the way the external tank does also have burner thrusters but those are on the engine cluster and those are only used to maintain the orientation of the engine cluster as it tries to re-enter through the atmosphere. It, they are not used prior to that and those are required for successful re-entry as is the reaction wheel on the engine cluster. Unfortunately it turned out that recovery of this engine cluster was not possible because inadequate electric charge was supplied to it and so it would likely lose control as it descended through the atmosphere the EDB will have to make sure that proper electric charge is supplied to this engine cluster in the next mission for recovery to take place. Fortunately, the eight thuds and the single skipper are far cheaper than a single mainsail would have been, and so and not too much of a loss on, this, on that aspect of this mission. Here we have the orbital burn for the shuttle at about 90 meters per second, and that will get us also our rendezvous with Hoffman Station. Since the shuttle is aiming for rendezvous rather than simply making orbit, it is not a pure prograde burn, as it is slightly radial in this case, but not a very taxing burn in any case. The result was a 2.4 kilometer rendezvous with Hoffman Station, and there we see the payload bay's opening and the three tanks carrying the 52 tons of fuel. There you also see the Das Valdez inspired docking port arrangement in the front. The Libertina 2 is now approaching Hoffman Station and it will make a very careful approach. Unfortunately there was one flaw with the shuttle system and that is that it does not have uh, forward facing Werner thrusters. It uh, has no way to push itself backward with its RCS system at this time. Well, not no way. It does have a secondary RCS ports which burn monopropellant that can do it, but they're not very powerful, not as powerful as the Werner thrusters. So in future missions, Werner thrusters will have to be supplied to be able to push the shuttle back. It does have control in other directions, however. The two missing Werner thrusters, however, will make it a little bit hard to approach the station, and so the shuttle crew will have to do so very slowly, because they won't be able to slow down using the RCS system uh, as quickly as they normally would. Here we go, coming close to Hoffman Station, an excellent view there. Lots of RCS fire using liquid fuel and oxidizer with the Werner thrusters. And of course, not all of the liquid fuel and oxidizer that is being displayed there is part of the shuttle system. Much of it, most of it, is part of the payload. Here the shuttle is approaching within 58 meters of the station, still targeting the station core rather than the target docking port. Uh, the target docking port is extending below the station from our vantage point there. And of course, the entire station was built out of shuttle payloads as well as the one external tank from the shuttle, which is the main fuel reservoir for the station. Of course, uh, what the shuttle is passing underneath now is a tug that was not launched by a shuttle, that was launched by another mission. And on the opposite side from the tug is the Orion 1 space plane. The hope is that this fuel being delivered might be enough to allow the Orion 1 space plane to proceed to other interplanetary destinations at least uh, to head for the moon, we will see what kind of mission uh, planners decide upon. Here now, approaching 12.6, 12.5 meters from the target docking port now. And here, control is changed to the docking port at the top of the shuttle, as the shuttle is already well lined up. Now at 5 meters in closing. Within 1 meter. Awaiting docking port magnetism. And we have magnetism and a connection. The shuttle is docked with the station for the first time. 
and is beginning to transfer fuel to the station's fuel reservoir. Here's an excellent view from the station's camera drones as the shuttle begins to prepare to depart. The mission called for the shuttle to make a quick turnaround and return on the same day it had departed. Hence the quick rendezvous on the first orbit. Here the shuttle is pulling away from the station. It has undocked and soon after that it will close its cargo bays and proceed to retroburn. It will be retroburning first to bring bring the opposite side down to 100 kilometers and then once it reaches its periapsis it will then bring its apoapsis directly down to 26 kilometers instead of holding at the 100 kilometer orbit. This is different from previous missions where the shuttle spent time loitering in the 100 kilometer orbit waiting for the KSC to get onto the daylight side. Here the KSC is already still in daylight and so the shuttle can make it back quickly. There you see the 26 kilometer periapsis was west of the eastern peninsula which means that the shuttle is currently undershooting by uh, normal planning but we're not entirely sure of the re-entry uh, capabilities of the shuttle and what pitch to set Right now it is at the normal 40 degree pitch as it re-enters through the upper atmosphere descending descending to 58 kilometers and below. Now at 50 kilometers, still at 40 degree pitch, getting some initial heating here. We're uh, just below 47 kilometers still at 48 degree pitch holding steady using the Werner thrusters uh, quite a bit and uh, pitch is close to being maxed out but still within normal parameters below 45 kilometers it looks like the orbit is undershooting and so the shuttle will decrease its pitch to increase its range here now below 40 kilometers at 25 degree pitch heading out over the western ocean 37 kilometers about a 20 degree pitch there 22 the trajectory is looking better now however the shuttle does have plenty of liquid fuel and of course four rapier engines which are more than enough to power it into a power landing and so much fuel reserves the empty tanks that were holding the fuel for the station are in the cargo bay so it is carrying still about 6.5 tons of payload back down here we see the orbit is going a little bit north and so the shuttle deviates to the south excellent control with the wings and so it is able to correct that fairly easily even at these high velocities you can see that the Verners are now off and the shuttle does not require the Verners except when it's trying to hold that 40 degree pitch. Uh, at a lower pitch it can easily handle itself. Uh, here it looks as though the shuttle is now overshooting which means it has a lot more lift than mission controllers initially expected and so it tries to slow down by presenting its flat side to the air but that doesn't produce much effect and so ultimately Chambury turns its pitch down and begins to descend in earnest. He was ascending with the high pitch profile. Okay, turning south of the KSC in order to allow for the turn towards it after the overshoot. It looks as though for the next mission the shuttle will maintain a high pitch instead of going to the 20 to 25 degree pitch that we saw and see if that will allow it to hit the KSC more decisively here. Okay, the shuttle is now around 11 kilometers altitude, just above the speed of sound. And now making its turn, the rapier engines are now in air breathing mode but not throttled up. 4 kilometers altitude, turning very smoothly. Velocity is a little bit low. Now below 4 kilometers and the runway is in sight. 
Shambury, of course, has landed a shuttle at the KSC previously, and so we expect that he'll be able to handle this fairly smoothly. Velocity is a bit low, though, so we expect that he will run the engines on the way in. Stall speed for the shuttle is around 60 meters per second. That's around 130 knots or so. The shuttle is heavier than it often would be. Still a lot of liquid fuel there. And most of that is contained on the rapier nacelles. Each of the rapier nacelles uh, contains 400 units of liquid fuel. There's also fuel in the tail that the uh, KS-25 is attached to. That is emergency reserves only and that remains locked uh, except in the most dire circumstances. Okay, here we have landing gear deployment. Looks like landing gear is down and locked. Approaching the runway. Two hundred meters. Fairly slow here, seventy five meters per second. One hundred meters. Fifty meters. Forty. 30, 20, 10, a bit of a run of the engines there, and touchdown, touchdown of ETS-11 with Chambery and Albert Kerman from their journey to Hoffman Station and back. So the Libertina 2 uh, performing marvelously on this mission, very successful mission to deliver fuel to the station. We have the drag chutes out, and the shuttle is slowing. With this mission, the shuttle team has successfully fended off the challenge from the Aquarius SSTO team, which had produced an SSTO fully recoverable with a 20 ton payload. The shuttle now has a payload capacity of well over three times the capacity of the Aquarius, and so it will be used for missions that the Aquarius cannot match. And there we have it. We hope you enjoyed this broadcast of ETS-11A with the Libertina 2, a successful test of the new shuttle system. If you did enjoy this coverage, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and we'll see you next time.